Welcome to The Great Detectives of Old Time Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. When you're making your summer travel plans, remember johnnydollarair.com first. johnnydollarair.com is a Priceline affiliate, so you get all the benefits of going through Priceline com, such as being able to name your price on hotels, rental cars, airline tickets, and even more, but it goes to support the great detectives of old time radio at no additional cost to you. So remember, when uh, making travel plans, check johnnydollarair.com first. Well, now it's time for today's episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, the original air date, July the 3rd, 1960, and this one is The Collector's Matter. Johnny Dollar. George Reed, Johnny, at Floyd's of England. Well, hiya, George. What can I do for you? Well, Johnny... Johnny, I'm afraid I've got myself into a rather embarrassing situation. Yeah, what have you done this time? One of the company's most important clients is a man named Orson Ogilvy Terwilliger. Retired. He's a collector. He lives down near the little town of Bethel, New York. Where's that? Across the Hudson, east of Poughkeepsie, between Monticello and Coshecton in the Mongop Valley. Yo, hold it. I'd better look it up on the map. Yes, I wish you would, Johnny. Then... Go on down there right away. Oh, why not? But what for? Terwilliger insists that someone from the company, preferably I, call on him immediately. Immediately, Johnny, regarding some change he wants to make in his life insurance policy. What kind of a change? Well, I haven't the least idea, but it's a really sizable policy. How sizable? Over half a million. That's sizable. With a double indemnity clause. Wow, we. You can see why it's important that we cater to this man. All right, so why don't you tear on down there? Well, you see, Johnny. Well, I. Oh, dear. Yeah? What's the matter, Georgie? I'm making this call from the city jail. You what? No, some fool <laughs> traffic cop. I mean, one of our fine highway patrolmen. Yeah. Well, I'm afraid in my anxiety to get down to see Mr. Terwilliger, well, I may have been speeding a little, and, well, I made the mistake of arguing with this this officer quite vehemently, oh, Johnny. Oh, no. And, well, my hearing isn't until tomorrow morning. Well, look, why don't you send somebody else from the office to see this man? And have my own employees find out what's happened? All right, then telephone him. And have him find out? No, please, Johnny. Go down there and... Listen, I'll double whatever your expenses are and give you $100 besides. Oh? But now, is that really all there is for me to do? Just find out from him what change he wants in his policy? Yes. Why do you ask that way? Oh, uh, nothing, nothing. Only every time you hand me one of these real easy assignments, I find I'm lucky to get out of it alive. CBS Radio brings you Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, Act One of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Floyd's of England, North American office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the collector's matter. Expense account item one, nine eighty five for a cab to Bradley Field and a plane to New York. Item two, fifty dollars deposit on a rental car, and I drove north and west on six and seventeen, and finally Route seventeen B in my search for the little town of Bethel. The foot of the Catskills country is mighty beautiful this time of year. I wonder it's a famous vacation spot for thousands who spend most of their lives in the noise and dirt of the big cities. Lots of mountains, trees, fresh air, and flowers. The so-called town of Bethel was little more than a crossroads with a couple of general stores and gas stations and Emma's Hotel. At Emma's, I asked directions to the Terwilliger place. Oh, you mean the big place over the lake? Well, I don't know, is it? Yeah, it's a beautiful place. And if they do decide to sell it, well, you know the rumors about it. Yeah, well, how do I get there? Well, you see that road right across the highway? Yeah, I see it. Well, first you pass Lake Superior... The Scott Place, yeah. about a mile and a half, maybe two miles. You see a turn to the left. Uh-huh. 
It takes you up the side of the little mountain to the big house. Okay, thanks. Such a narrow, twisting road, though, so be careful when you drive. Oh, sure, and I'm but much... But such a beautiful view it gives of Mr. Tervilico's private lake. Oh, that's fine. I'll give it a good look. And maybe he'll show you his wonderful collection of guns and weapons that he has. Yeah, beautiful guns. Yes, I'll ask him about them, and thanks and again. And when you come back, if you feel like a nice, cool beer on this hot Yes, I'll stop by again. Thanks. I passed the Lake Superior, he'd mentioned. Then a couple of miles beyond, made a left turn that put me on the narrow, winding road up the side of a hill above another, a smaller lake. I wondered why Terwilliger, with all his money, hadn't improved this road. And thought of what might happen to someone trying to negotiate it too fast. Well, I didn't have time to think about it for long. Huh? The other car must have been coming down the hill, but apparently had taken the narrow little turn much too quickly, then skidded and rolled over to land against a huge boulder that stuck out on the side of the hill just below the road. After a struggle with it, I managed to get one of the doors open to see if the man inside was still alive. He wasn't, though his body was still warm. I reached into his pocket, pulled out a billfold, looked at the driver's license in it. Yeah. Orson O. Terwilliger. In the history of America, the inventor has had a place of importance equal to that of statesmen and other national leaders. Indeed, our inventors, many of them mechanics, craftsmen, or even thoughtful tinkerers, have strongly influenced our destiny. They have contributed greatly to our amazing development from a barren outpost of civilization to the foremost industrial nation in the world. Incidentally, when we think of great inventions, it's natural to think of involved mechanisms like the McCormick Reaper, the sewing machine, or the phonograph. However, some inventions are so simple, one wonders why they weren't thought of centuries before. An invention in this category is, of all things, the universal, all-important safety pin. This was the invention of Walter Hunt, who lived in New York in the first half of the past century. Between 1832 and 1859, he created and patented more original and worthwhile inventions than any man in the country. A revolver, a repeating rifle, and a bullet with a metal cartridge containing its own explosive charge. But of all his simple inventions, the safety pin is the most useful. It was patented in 1849, and he gave the patent to a draftsman in discharge of a very small debt. Perhaps it is safe to say that Walter Hunt's little invention has been known and used from infancy to old age by more people than any other mechanical contrivance in the world. In recognizing the need for a safety pen, Walter Hunt had the viewpoint of so many American inventors. Somehow there must be a way. Let's find it. Now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Collector's Matter. Yeah, the man lying there in the car that had skidded off the road was the man I'd come to see, Orson O. Terwilliger, and he was very dead. Not knowing what sort of police or medical facilities the town of Bethel had to offer, I decided to poke around a bit. But before I could lift the body out of this car, another one came down the narrow road from the direction of the big house on top of the hill. Well, stranger, did you have some trouble with your... Oh, no, that's Orson's car. This gal was a doll, maybe five foot two with blonde hair and for a moment sparkling blue eyes. And a figure inside her tight blue capris and yellow silk shirt that would have made any man turn his head. She stood there a moment, staring at the body, a look of utter disbelief on her lovely face. Then I caught her as she started to slump to the ground, hands covering her face, her whole body shuddering with her sobs. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm terribly sorry. I... Why did a thing like this have to happen? Just when Orson and I were... Easy now, easy. Just take uh, it easy. Oh, if it makes you feel better, go no. ahead. No. What good is it to cry over him? It won't... It won't bring him back to life. No, I'm... I'm afraid nothing will now. 
Why does it have to happen to people like... I'm terribly sorry. I didn't mean to throw myself into your arms. Oh, that's uh, perfectly all right. The shock of suddenly... I'm Blanche Terwilliger, his wife. Who are you? My name is Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar? The insurance investigator? Yes, that's right, Mrs. Terwilliger. Your husband had asked that I, well, that someone for the office. Sounds like a terrible thing to say, Johnny. Yeah? But I'm glad it was you who found him there. Oh? After all the awful things that people... Only they aren't true at all. They never were. They... Well, we'd better... I I suppose we'd better call Dr. Parker and the police and... Shall we go up to the house, Johnny? Yeah. Sure. At the house, I made the call to Dr. Parker. In a matter of minutes, he and another man, a Mr. Harry Allen, arrived, and together we went back and inspected the scene of the accident. No question to me. No question at all. Ah, yes, Mr. Dollar, I'm the whole police force here in Bethel. Somebody's got to do it. I see, Mr. Allen. Uh, Chief. Don't you uh, agree, Doctor? Plain as day, isn't it? Yeah, Chief. Mr. Dollar, it's just an unfortunate accident. Those marks on his head and body are simply a result of the car rolling over. All of them, Doctor? Know why Orson didn't know better than to take this turn too fast is... Uh, what did you say, Mr. Dollar? Well, this bruise on his forehead when he struck the windshield. That's right. Killed him instantly. And here, on his chest, from the steering wheel. Uh Uh-huh. But that, uh, that round contusion, I guess you'd call it, there behind his left ear, small, a perfect circle. Mm -hmm. Something inside the car when it rolled. Was it? Yep. Maybe. Suppose you show me one thing, anything, inside the car that could have made that clean, clear mark. Now, you look here, Dollar. Yes, Chief. It was pure accident that killed him, no doubt about it. The doc knows it, I know it, and you know it. Just because you're one of these high-powered, big-city-type special investigators, just don't let your imagination run away with you. Chief is right, Mr. Dollar. Sure. Now, come on. Let's haul the body up to the house and help Mrs. Terwilliger make arrangements with that funeral home down to Monticello. Anything else we can do? Very good idea, Chief. And, uh, say, Dollar, you're a healthy young buck with a sharp eye. Now, what's that supposed to mean? Well, now you tell me the truth. Don't you think Terwilliger's wife is one of the prettiest girls you ever did see? Yeah, she is. Such a shame that she and him never really... Rumor, uh, Chief. That's just a lot of idle gossip. Yeah, yeah, Doc. I guess you're right. Is he, Chief? Huh? I wonder... Up at the big home on the hill, Mrs. Terwilliger, only I called her Blanche now, at her insistence, she called to make arrangements for her husband's funeral. Considering her obvious shock over the whole affair, she was doing very well. She'd also call one of the local garages to remove the wreck of the car. It would be so horrible to have to see it there day after day, that car, the thing that killed him. Yes, yes, I know what you mean. You're very understanding, Johnny, and... I like you for it. Yeah, well, I... uh... Yeah, I guess there's nothing further that we can do now. I've made out the death certificate and, uh... Um, Blanche, my dear. Yes, Doctor? You sure you wouldn't like to come down the hill, stay with Mrs. Parker and me until this is all over? Oh, no, Doctor, but thank you very much. You've all been wonderful to me, and I appreciate it. That means you too, Chief Allen. Oh, now, it's a real pleasure, Miss Blanche. Well, yeah, I suppose we... Oh, but Johnny. Yes? Would you stay and help me make out the insurance? Oh, it sounds terrible to talk about it at a time like this. Uh, Yeah, but all those things have to be done, my dear. So, Mr. Dollar, if you'd like to stay here... Uh, No, no, I'd better run on down to Amherst Hotel and arrange for a place to stay overnight. A hotel when we have this nice big house with plenty of... I'm sorry. I forgot that I'm alone now. You really shouldn't be, my dear. Johnny, maybe you'd come back to tell me what I must do about the insurance. 
Maybe have dinner with me? Oh, that would be a good idea. Yeah. Maybe it is. Expense account item three ninety cents for a phone call at Emmer's Hotel. Orson Terwilliger is dead. And George, there's just one thing I want to know. Johnny, I simply can't... Yes, what is it? Who are the beneficiaries of Terwilliger's insurance? Why, there's only one. His wife, Blanche Terwilliger. Yes. I knew it. George, is that policy pretty much a standard form? Yes, it is. Double indemnity, as I think I told you. But he said he wanted some changes made. Well, to quote him exactly, he said he wanted to make a change in it. But frankly, I can't imagine what or why. Five will get you ten. He wanted to change the beneficiary. Really? But the beautiful Blanche played it smart. She didn't give him a chance. Yes, I suppose that is a... What? Yeah. Now, Johnny, no, listen. If you mean what I think you do, what I mean is... Yeah, George. Give it some thought. Who administers the oath of office to the President of the United States? And for that matter, what is the oath of office? You may not know the answer to the first question. You should know the answer to the second. Because before a man can become president, he must pledge himself to do two things. First, he must pledge that he will in fact perform the duties of the president. And second, that he will perform them in accordance with our constitution. This pledge is called the oath of office. It is very short and reads as follows. I do solemnly swear, or affirm, that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. That is the oath of office. The President takes it. But who administers it? The answer is that the Constitution does not say... Washington was sworn in by an official of New York City. Calvin Coolidge took the oath of office before his own father in the family homestead in Vermont. Frequently, it's administered by the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. But the important point is not who administers the oath, but that the president, before he becomes president, shall swear to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution. Because it is the Constitution which ensures that your country and mine shall be our country under God. Now, Act Three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> Dr. Parker and Chief Allen were convinced that Terwilliger's death was accidental. Well, I wasn't. Yet, all I had to go on, some talk the Terwilliger place might be put up for sale... And nothing in itself unless I could find out why. Or perhaps the reason might tie in with the rumors, the, the gossip that had been mentioned to me. Rumors of what? That Blanche and her husband weren't getting along? As for actual evidence that he was murdered, all I had to go on was that funny little mark behind his ear. I borrowed a flashlight there at the hotel and drove back to the scene of the so-called accident. I went over the ground with a fine-tooth comb. Nothing. Then I went up to the place where the car must have started its skid. I searched the bushes all around, and then... Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What on the sun is... And more important, where did it come from? It's much longer than an ordinary. Hmm. As for the fletching... Yeah, this thing's been used all right, and recently. And instead of a point, it has the heavy round stone head. Hmm. Who is it? Speak up or I'll shoot. Oh, that's a... Nice way to welcome a dinner guest. Johnny. Johnny, you got me first. Oh, well, I, I'm sorry, Blanche. I... I saw your flashlight down here and couldn't imagine who it was. And since you hadn't come up to dinner as you promised. Oh, I was on my way. I, I hope I'm not too late. Hey, do you always wander around carrying a gun? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Here, you'd better take it. Yeah. I'm not used to these things, though heaven knows I've seen enough of them. Your husband's gun collection. But why'd you stop here, Johnny? What were you doing in... What in the world's that? Oh, just a... Well, there, there must have been some Indians around here at one time or another. Oh, yes. I understand this was great Indian country. But now, Johnny... Yeah? My invitation to dinner still stands. Great. I'm starving. Oh, 
Oh, mighty fine dinner, Blanche. More coffee? I'm almost embarrassed, though. Now, why do you say that? What? A chance to be close to someone as well. More coffee? Oh, no, no, thanks. Not another thing. Well, then, let's go in by the fire in the library and talk. Johnny. Yeah? It's a great comfort to have you here, and I'm thankful. You, uh, you don't mind if I hold your hand? Kid stuff, huh? No, it isn't. Uh, uh, now, this collection of weapons you were going to show me. Oh, you have to look at it. Well, I, I'd kind of like to. All right. It's in the library, too. Okay. You know, Blanche, with your figure... Hmm? Well, I, uh, well, what I meant was you must have been quite the athlete when you were in college. Now, what brought that on? Swimming? Tennis? That sort of thing? Sure, everything. Blanche Ransom, girl athlete. Uh, pistol team? The way you handled this gun a while ago. Only a person who knows guns has the proper respect for them. Well, I still don't like them. Then all things considered, it's better that I keep this one. What? All things considered? Your husband had to drive very slowly around that curve, didn't he? Yeah. I guess he didn't for once, or he wouldn't. Have... Slowly enough so that somebody couldn't have missed him with a pea shooter, much less a deadly weapon. Johnny, what in the world? Archery was your best event, wasn't it? Archery? Yeah. Yeah. I'm afraid that's why I took your hand. Johnny. Calluses like that come from only one thing, using a heavy bow, a hunting bow. This one here on the wall? No. Johnny, listen, honestly. Honey, why did you do it? Why did you do it, Blanche? I, I don't know what With you... this bow and with the arrow I found out there... Johnny! With his flat, round, heavy stone head just before he reached that curve in the road. Well. All right, Johnny. But listen, if you knew how long I... If you knew what I had to... Listen, please. Murder. For a chance and a lousy million bucks. I, I guess I lost. Didn't I? Oh, yeah. You lost. And according to the law, no person convicted of the murder of the decedent shall be entitled to any portion of the estate, including the insurance. But just don't forget my commission on that amount. Expense account total, including room and board at Emmer's and the trip back to Hartford, one eighty-five sixty, Doubled. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Truly Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood and is written, produced, and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, G. Stanley Jones, Forrest Lewis, Vic Perrin, and Bart Robinson. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is John Wall speaking.
Money Dollar has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. This is Andrew from otrwesterns.com. I wanted to invite you to come take a look at our site where we put out podcasts of old time radio westerns. Check us out at otrwesterns.com. You're listening to the great detectives of old time radio with Adam Graham. Now let's get back into the show. Welcome back. Orson Ogilby Terwilliger was not only a big policy holder uh, with uh, Lloyds of England, but he also qualified for their eccentric name discount. And they, they give a lot of those over at Floyd's. This one was kind of obvious uh, pretty early on in the widow's appearance. And this is just an observation. Typically, grieving widows do not shift into philosophical mode about the death of their husbands at the scene where his body has been found before it's even been removed. That's something that happens over the course of months, which says that really uh, your cried a few crocodile tears couldn't be bothered to keep up appearances of mourning and just quickly abandon the whole idea, which is really suspicious. And also, trying to flirt with the insurance company detective? That's also generally not a sign of sincere mourning. So the clothes were laid out pretty clearly. Because it was audio, there was no neon sign. But other than that, I think it was pretty clear that she was the murderer. But it was more of a question of how. I did find the public service announcements interesting, as always. Uh, the bit on the oath of office of the president was interesting. I, I think that probably today more people could name who actually administered the oath, the Chief Justice, than what the oath was about. And uh, the ad's right that the, it's more important what it's about. So it's some interesting insight. All right, that will do it for today. Join us back here tomorrow for Dragnet. Uh, next Tuesday, we will be bringing you Pat Novak for hire. And then next Friday, another episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends.